Today, let's continue to learn the practice of exchanging self and others. After generating the Supreme Buddha Chitta, everything we do is for the benefit of sentient beings. As long as you have Buddha Chitta, no matter what you do, you are practicing Buddha Chitta. This nature won't change. However, if you forget or lose Buddha Chitta, everything that you do won't lead you to Buddhahood. This is why it says, if one forgets Buddha Chitta and engages in various virtuous actions, it is called the work of the Mara. Self-grasping prevents Buddhacitta from arising and hinders the present Buddhacitta from continuing and growing. Not continuing means the arisen Buddhacitta will decline or disappear. How can we overcome self-grasping and cultivate pure altruism? We should face all sentient beings who have a karmic connection with us in our daily lives and do whatever benefits them. Through actual practice, we can nurture compassion and strengthen altruism. By letting go of selfishness, you will no longer bring any suffering to yourself, be it the suffering of change, the suffering of suffering, or the all-pervasive suffering. Because you don't seek to benefit yourself, you naturally won't experience these three types of suffering. However, if we pursue our own benefit, everything we do will inevitably result in all pervasive suffering, the suffering of change and the suffering of suffering. Benefiting others doesn't mean bringing the suffering of change to sentient beings. When we benefit sentient beings, we intend to help them attain liberation. If you help sentient beings with Buddha Chitta, the benefit you bring to them is liberation from samsara. However, if you don't have Buddha Chitta, the benefit you bring to them is the suffering of change. In reality, what you bring to them is suffering known as the suffering of change. We often mistakenly believe that bringing the suffering of change to others is benefiting them. In reality, this is not true. It is merely giving them the suffering of change and all pervasive suffering. Therefore, it is not truly benefiting others. Truly benefiting others means helping sentient beings transcend all three types of suffering. To achieve this goal, we should help them attain liberation from samsara and ultimately achieve Buddhahood. Those who can do so have generated genuine Buddhacitta. Of course, initially, we should liberate sentient beings from the three types of suffering. Then, we can guide them to cultivate great wisdom, practice the Buddhasattva path, and join us in benefiting other sentient beings and leading them to Buddhahood. This is the genuine, ultimate and perfect altruism. Other altruistic activities that bring the three types of suffering to sentient beings are worldly welfare and samsaric suffering. If you bring samsaric suffering to sentient beings, you are not benefiting them. Ordinary beings may mistakenly consider such actions as altruistic. There is a fundamental difference between them. You must figure out whether you have Buddha Chitta when helping others. Kam Langpa said, Because we abandon sentient beings, they also treat us in the same way. Kam Langpa said, Because we have been abandoning sentient beings since beginningless time, sentient beings also treat us in the same way. 
Sentient beings also disregard us. When we experience the suffering of suffering, no one helps us. When we experience the suffering of change, no one tells us it is the suffering of change. When driven by all pervasive suffering, no one tells us this is not the right path and does not lead to liberation. This is the situation when we lack merits. The lack of merits is because we didn't help others. As a result, when we encounter difficulties and need help, no one helps us. In reality, our wealth is accumulated while helping others. By dedicating yourself to serving others for countless culpas, you will naturally have merits. Besides compassion, the ability to help others is also essential. If you can genuinely help sentient beings, your merits will be great. Some people often complain about not receiving the recognition they deserve or not getting help from others. However, we can reflect on ourselves. How much have we done for others? How much help have we provided? How much contribution have we made to society? Have we almost consumed all our merits? Whether one has established the foundation of Mahayana and entered the Mahayana path depends on it. The meaning is, are you a Mahayana practitioner? Have you established the foundation of Mahayana? Some people not to mention establishing it, don't even understand what it means. They don't know what Buddhacitta is. Although they talk about benefiting sentient beings and practicing the Buddhisattva path every day, they don't even understand it. Whether we are Mahayana practitioners depends on whether we have generated Buddhacitta. If we have generated Buddhacitta, we are Mahayana practitioners. Otherwise, we are not. The message is clear. Those who don't follow the stages of practice may consider themselves remarkable. They may believe they have Buddhacitta, but actually they don't. There are many such people. For example, after watching others playing football, a football fan may think they too can play football. However, they only know how to watch the game, but cannot play it. If they were to play football, they might end up injuring themselves. Many people are like this. After seeing others doing something, they believe they can also do it. However, in fact, they cannot. Similarly, you may see someone writing calligraphy beautifully, yet if you try it yourself, even if you spend 10 years, 20 years, or even a lifetime, you may not reach the same level. You can only appreciate calligraphy. Even if you were a great calligrapher in a past life, you would still need to start practicing calligraphy from scratch in this lifetime. The principle is the same. The same applies to spiritual practice. Even if you made spiritual progress in past lives, if you don't practice diligently in this lifetime, you may forget what you have cultivated or even regress. Therefore, we must make persistent efforts. If we achieve a stage of realization in this lifetime, it will be easier. At the very least, you should strive to attain the first stage of enlightenment in this lifetime and cultivate a qualified Buddhacitta. Thus, you won't regress in your next lifetime. Even if you temporarily forget, you will quickly reconnect with your previous practice. 
you'll naturally have the aspiration to renounce worldly life and pursue the spiritual path from a young age. Nowadays, many young people apply for ordination in our Dharma Centre. Today, a child who was less than three years old expressed the wish to become a monk. His mother told him, I will become a monastic first, and you can follow me later. But the child replied, Let me become a monastic first, and then you can follow. He was only two and a half years old, but would prostrate to me when he saw me. His mother never taught him to do so, and she didn't even know how to prostrate. Such people may have roots of virtue. They are different from other children when they see me. They would put their palms together and bow down. At the very least, they would put their palms together and bow to me. Even their gaze is different. Perhaps they were my disciples in a past life. They have roots of virtue. As the saying goes, heroes emerge at a young age. Great masters, too, emerge from a young age. We can often observe their exceptional qualities from their early years. In this era, those who choose to renounce worldly life are remarkable. I believe those who sincerely aspire to become monastics in this era are practitioners from past lives. If they follow a good spiritual teacher, they can achieve significant accomplishments. However, without encountering a qualified teacher, it is hard to make spiritual progress. The situation in the Han region of China is different from that in the Tibetan region. In the Han region, it is not easy to devote oneself to spiritual practice due to the lack of qualified teachers and social norms. Therefore, it requires deep roots of virtue to become a monastic in the Han region. However, the situation is different in Tibet. In Tibet, becoming a monastic is as easy as going to school. All their families support them. 